Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Robin Archer. I'm the director of the Ralph Miliband program here at the London School of Economics. And I'm super pleased to welcome our speaker, Professor Helen Thompson. Um, Helen is a fellow of Clare College and a professor of political economy at Cambridge University, where she's been, I just discovered, almost 30 years, not, 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 not quite. Um, and before that, she studied at Warwick University here at the London School of Economics. And she's got a, a fascinating output both scholarly and in public. In fact, in many ways, she's one of the most prolific public intellectuals um, that we have in England today. Amongst other things, she's been a re regular columnist for the New Statesman. And many of you might have listened in to the podcast, Talking Politics, in which she was one of two people that were a, a key anchor for that. Well, in the last few years, she's been particularly interested in trying to understand the world that's emerged since the global financial crisis of, you know, around 2008. And she's written various things about it, about the political economy of oil, about Brexit, about um, the Eurozone crisis, and other things besides. And many of those interests have been brought together in an important book, which she published just last year, a few, a few months ago. It's called disorder, hard times in the 21st century. And in it, she brings together a confluence of three different geopolitical, economic, and uh, democratic factors to argue that the disorder, to explain the disorder, which is in, in the title. Well, that's the theme that I think we're going to hear about tonight. Um, Professor Thompson's going to talk for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, and then there's going to be a short period of maybe 15 minutes or so chair-led discussion. That means I get to ask the speaker questions. And after that, there should be plenty of time for all of you to um, uh, ask questions too. Just one point, we have a large audience that's not, we have a very nice audience in the room, but we also have another nice audience that's on the um, online. So we'll be trying to take questions from, from both of those sources. Before I end, can I just ask you to join me in welcoming our speaker, Professor Helen Thompson. Well, thanks very much, um, Robin, for that very warm introduction. And thanks to you all very much for, um, for coming. I'm going to frame what I want to talk about today, in the first instance anyway, primarily about geopolitics. And I'm going to talk, first of all, about the past, geopolitics of energy in the past, and move on to the present and the future. And I'm going to do it this way, because I think that it's not possible to understand just why the geopolitics of energy is as important to our future as it is, unless we understand the pivotal place that energy played in the geopolitical history of the 20th century and the first part of the, the 21st um, century. So I'm going to start really in like the 1890s, so the turn of the, the, the century, last century. Um, and what is true then, I think we would all you know, agree, uh, is that the world geopolitically was dominated by one particular European power, the British Empire. Um, and then the other European powers, the French uh, in particular, um, but also a, a rising um, Germany, 
certainly arise in Germany uh, industrially, um, were pretty significant. Now, I don't think anybody at the turn of that century would have said that the United States and Russia were insignificant, certainly not Russia, given its territorial size at that point and the fact that it engaged in centuries worth of expansion to the um, Pacific um, coast. But I think that if you could have stopped at that moment and said, like in 50 years time, the two dominant powers in the world by far will be Russia, except it would be the Soviet Union, and the United States, people would have been pretty surprised. And I think that if we, by contrast, for a moment anyway, be an energy determinist about this, we wouldn't have been surprised because we would have seen, if we've been thinking about energy, that oil was becoming very important, not economically yet, but in terms of hopes for military, sorry, hopes for naval power. So all British, the Germans, indeed the Americans, were all quite focused on the idea that whoever got to having oil-based navies first, a oil-based navy, would be the dominant power in the future. Uh, and that's really what gave oil its first push in terms of shaping the nature of geopolitical competition. And this had really profound significance, I think, for Europe, um, because what was true was that none of these European empires, not least the British, had any domestic oil. The only European countries at the beginning of the 20th century that did were Austria, um, and then it was awkwardly um, placed in, um, in, in Galicia, so it wasn't easy to get to the um, sea. Uh, and Austria wasn't an imperial power outside Europe and Romania. Um, and it became central to the geopolitical competition between the British and the Germans, actually, more really than the French um, initially, to try to control the territory in the Middle East, controlled in part by the Ottomans, Persian um, territory, where there was reasonable prospects of oil being discovered. I think what's important to see here is that the First World War was in significant ways played out about oil. Now, by that, I don't mean to say that oil caused the First World War, but that it really mattered which European powers ended up on the winning side where the war in the Middle East was concerned. And the answer was the British and the French, and that the Germans were systematically shut out uh, of, the, um, of the Middle East. And I don't think you can understand then the catastrophes that would then ensue um, around Germany's position through the, the Nazi period without seeing the way in which Germany um, not just actually in the Nazi period, but in the in the Weimar period um, as well, tried to come up with remedies for its defeat in that intra-European competition about controlling um, oil resources in non-Western parts of the world. The first response under the Weimar period was, okay, we need to manufacture artificial oil, what's called synthetic oil, use coal, which we do have in abundance, and turn it into oil. And then Hitler's response was to conquer the parts of Europe, particularly Russia, or to try to conquer, with catastrophic consequences, as we know, for the populations that lived through the territory that had to be um, conquered in order to get Germany that oil supply. That is one story of the, the, the Second World War. If we move on then to the post Second World War, well, what we can see is that this need for oil for European countries and the problem that they have that they don't actually have any hasn't gone away. In fact, it's going to make a lot, lot harder for them because by the 1950s, oil is starting to becoming much more important economically. And it's obviously necessary for mass car society. And what we can see in the post-1945 world um, is that the Americans now don't actually want European countries, West European countries, um, buying, not only do they not want them buying American oil, they don't want them buying oil from the Western Hemisphere altogether. So not from Mexico or Venezuela um, 
either. Um, they want them to buy oil from the Middle East. And they need, in that sense, the Americans need the British actually to stay and act as an imperial power in the Middle East in order to protect Western Europe's oil security there. So when the British government in 1956 in the Suez crisis goes to war with Egypt, it's actually doing what it's supposed to do in the way in which the Americans have thought about the post-war um, world. But Eisenhower sees the absolute problem for American power of looking like he's siding or America's siding with the European imperial powers, the British and the French um, in, the, um, in the Middle East. Now in this story then, the 70s becomes a really important juncture because it's at this point that the Americans move into a position that is much more similar to the Europeans than has previously been the case. That isn't because the American didn't have any oil industry in the 1970s onwards, it did. But American oil production prior to the shale boom peaked in 1970. So it was on a downward trajectory. And that meant during the course of the 1970s that the United States itself became the largest oil importing country in the world. And it is in that context that the United States had to have a much more active approach to the Middle East than it had previously um, had. Now, for a long time, it tried to deal with that by, first of all, using Saudi Arabia, using Iran until the Iranian revolution, actually letting Iraq do some of the work for it during the Iran-Iraq um, war, before Iraq's invasion uh, of Kuwait in in, in 1990. And I think you can see the second Iraq war, so the war that um, George W. Bush um, began to remove Saddam Hussein from power in 2003 as having a quite strong oil logic to it too. And that was by that point in the early 21st um, century um, that the amount of oil that was being produced was beginning to stagnate. Now, there's lots of complicated reasons um, for um, that. Some countries' oil produ production was actually rising, like um, Russia's. Some was running into lots of political difficulties, like in Venezuela. Venezuela, The Saudi oil fields were beginning to um, age. But in a fundamental sense, I think the point of removing Saddam Hussein from power um, was to turn Iraq or create a space in which Iraq could be a top tier oil producer, something akin to Saudi Arabia um, and um, the uh, and um, <clears throat> Russia. And as we know, that is not the way in which the Iraq war um, turned out. To this day, Iraq is producing about four and a half million um, barrels of oil a day, um, when the hope was that Iraq would be producing about 12 million barrels of oil. Um, a day. And the reason why that was so important, addressing the supply of oil uh, in the middle of the 2000s or in the first years of the 21st century, I should say, perhaps um, say, was because in that decade, a big demand shock hit the world economy. And that came from China's rapid economic growth um, during the period after China joined the World Trade Organization and India's oil consumption was also growing um, at the, the same time. And what we can see really from 2005 um, is that the world has been living um, with an oil predicament. Um, that is, is that if you take out the American shale oil boom, which didn't start until the 2010s um, really, and just look at the production from the countries that were producing oil at that point, minus shale and minus the tar sands in, in Canada, there wouldn't be enough oil to meet the volume of demand um, once China's and India's demand accelerated in the way in which it did. So really, the world economy functioned in the 2010s off American shale oil. Americans got back to producing more oil than they'd ever produced um, before. This was, though, incredibly geopolitically disruptive of the US-Saudi um, relationship. And given that the Americans were also producing gas, indeed they've got even more shale gas than shale oil, it introduced a whole new complication into the geopolitics of Europe, um, which was that that competition between American and Russian oil companies that existed at the beginning of the 21st century 
was now replicated in terms of American shell producers versus Gazprom, the Russian gas um, firm. So what we see is, is that European countries divided really as to how much that they wanted to buy American gas compared to carrying on buying um, Russian pipeline gas. And we know that Germany was very firmly in that we're carrying on with Russian pipeline gas. Poland was a country that regarded being able to import liquid natural gas from the United States as quite literally getting its sovereignty um, back again. That's how important it was um, to, um, to um, Poland. So I don't think it's possible to understand the deterioration of the US-Russian relationship or indeed the divisions within the European Union over energy without seeing the way in which the American shale boom transformed the geopolitics of the 21st century in its second um, decade. So where does this leave us like looking um, forward? Because obviously um, we're living through an attempted energy revolution. We're living through an attempt to rewire the energy foundations of our material civilization um, and to leave, or if not to leave fossil fuel energy entirely behind, but largely to leave it um, behind. And I think if we just start there for a moment, what we sh should think when we look at this historically, and indeed I think we can see this already um, playing out, that whichever state is geo, sorry, I'm going to put that differently, whichever state is most successful in the energy transition will be the one that we should expect to be geopolitically dominant. Now, there's some caveats that I'm going to put to that, but if we think about it in straight those terms for a moment, the state that is clearly ahead where the energy transition is concerned and has all kinds of advantages is China. Um, that China dominates, for instance, solar panel production. It's ahead in a number of areas in relation to electric um, vehicles, and it pretty much completely dominates the supply chains around um, metals to the point where um, first Trump and now effectively carried on by Biden, as Washington has declared an em a metals emergency, a metals and min minerals emergency for the United States in terms of um, catching um, up. And if you look at the US Inflation Reduction Act, that strange piece of legislation that's all about the energy transition and climate and yet goes under that um, title, it's very clear that a central part of the energy transition um, as it's conceived in Washington is to play catch up with China uh, and to use the energy transition as a way of reshoring supply chains away from China, reshoring manufacturing production back to the um, United States. So what we can see is that we've already, we're already witnessed to, in that sense, quite significant geopolitical competition over the energy um, transition. And it's one, that Sino-American competition, and particularly the American response to it, that has left many European countries and the European Union itself quite aghast. Look at some of the rhetoric that's come out in European capitals about the Inflation Reduction Act. President Macron referred to it as um, super um, aggressive. Nonetheless, I think that it's important to see that whilst we have entered this new geopolitical world created by the energy um, transition, um, that there are both ways in which that geopolitical competition will not be the same as what we saw with fossil fuel and energy and oil in particular in the, the, the 20th century, and the fossil fuel energy geopolitics won't go away. So let's just take the first point um, first. I think that what we can see is that although it would certainly seem to be the case that um, metals are arbitrarily, necessary metals for the energy transition are fairly arbitrarily distributed under the Earth's surface in the way in which oil and gas or hydrocarbons are, are arbitrarily um, distributed. 
that it's probably not quite the same to be without metals as it was to be without oil, particularly if you were a European country at the beginning of the, the 20th century. This isn't just a question of where the metals are. It's a question, I think, as well, of how much domestic political tolerance there is for extracting those metals. So probably the United States wouldn't actually be so behind on the metal side of things if it had the same attitude that China has had to metals and rare earth minerals in particular since the, the 19, um, 1950s. Now this I think has particular consequences for European countries because also um, European countries are much, or most of them anyway, much more densely populated than the United States. And so the consequences of metal extraction ecologically um, and socially are going to be, I think, quite different in, um, in Europe. But it's also the case, I think, that Europeans, we, as Euro we in Europeans, I'm not accepting myself from this, um, haven't really got our heads around what it will mean to need these metals. And there's a kind of assumption that it can go off in other, could take place in other parts of the world because we don't, in some sense, want to dirty our hands with it. But actually, that is going to mean going and looking to do extraction and having European companies in those parts of the world, at least some of the time that European countries colonized. It's going to recreate the historical tensions around that. And it's going to mean that the European countries are going to hold on to their fossil fuel energy advantages, lecture the developing countries about how they need the energy um, transition, whilst trying to make sure that their interests where metals are concerned are better served than the places where the metals are being extracted um, from. So as a final um, point from my, my, what I wanna say first of all is, I think it's important to see how um, even as the energy transition takes place and will accelerate that fossil fuel energy geopolitics isn't going to go away. And I think that Russia's war against Ukraine has actually made this, um, this um, pretty clear. And I'm just going to give you like one um, example. Um, and that is, is what has happened in terms of gas competition between European countries and Asian countries um, since the, the war began. We've heard quite a lot of self-congratulatory, congratulatory, um, rhetoric, I think, in Europe about how we've done much better in adjusting to um, reduced supply from Russia than many people had suggested would be um, the case. Um, well, one of the reasons for that, certainly where gas is concerned, is, is because European countries have priced the poor Asian countries, in some cases, entirely out of the liquid natural gas market. So if you take a country like Pakistan, Pakistan had quite a number of long-term natural gas contracts. Germany, as we know, when this war started, not only had no liquid natural gas long-term contracts, it had no liquid natural gas ports. It was entirely dependent upon pipelined um, gas, um, <clears throat> either from Norway or from, um, Norway or from um, Russia. Part of the reason why Germany, and I'm picking on Germany because Germany is the one that started with no ports, Part of the reason why Germany has done okay through this um, war is because the companies that were contracted to supply gas to Pakistan have broken their contracts and sold it, sent it, sold it to European countries in Germany in the spot uh, markets. And the money that they've been able to charge European countries for that gas has made more than compensated for the penalties they have to pay for breaking the contracts to um, Pakistan. As a consequence of this, Pakistan has now basically said that they're going to be looking to take gas as far as possible out of electricity um, generation and build some new coal-fired power stations. So this is a case in point where what we can see is really what I now begin to call structural Eurasian competition over constrained fossil fuel energy and gas uh, in um, particular. And that geopolitics of that is both gonna matter in itself, and it's also gonna matter in terms of climate diplomacy. 
because it becomes very difficult um, for um, European countries in um, particular to try to persuade a country like Pakistan um, to accelerate the energy um, transition when Pakistan is the loser in this structural competition between European countries and Asian countries. On that note, I'm going to let Robin ask you some questions. Good, thank you. Well, thanks so much for that. <laughs> As I said at the outset, I'm now going to ask um, our speaker a few questions and then after all, we're going to open it up to everyone else. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to start by taking back to the beginning of your comments. You, you said start in 1890 and then you sort of moved on to the First World War. And the essential thesis was that oil was central to the ability to succeed in that military conflict. And then your final comments here, you've, you've talked again about uh, how even under a new regime, you know, if China had advantages, it would be energy. That's what mattered. It, it made me think the comments about the First World War of, of another scholar on that topic, whose book was called, I think it was called something like The First World War, an agrarian interpretation. This is Avner Offer. Mm -hmm. So it's a famous interpretation of the First World War. It basically says that what mattered was access to food, to wheat. And so my question to you is, why is oil the important commodity rather than wheat or rather than food? Why is energy rather than food? After all, we see lots of conflicts coming out of Ukraine at the moment where food is an important factor too. I just wondered if you could reflect on that. Why centre energy rather than food? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to minimise the importance of food to um, the First World War. And actually, I give an example where the wheat question and the oil question actually go together, um, which is the problems that were caused for Britain and France and Russia by the fact that the Ottomans closed the Black Sea. Uh, and that meant it was impossible for wheat exports from Russia and also meant it was impossible to get Russian oil to Britain um, and France. And I think that that is the context in which the, the failed Dardanelle campaign should be um, understood. So in that respect, I would say that the question of um, the supply of food um, was in what's the way of putting this in terms of the, the battles of the war and the military outcomes at least comparable with each other i think that the the, the thing that's that's difficult to suggest is that there was i'm prepared to be told i'm wrong about this but i would i would say that um I'm not sure that there's a clear pattern um, of rivalry about food in the build-up to the First World War. I think there's lots of concern in Britain about what it means to be dependent upon imported food and needing a naval strategy in some sense to deal with that um, problem. But I think you'd be hard pushed to say that there's some part um, of the territorial conflict of the First World War that was about who was going to control the food resources after the war ended. I'm not so sure that isn't, that might be more dubious about the Second World War. But I think that if you look at the war in the Middle East during the, the First World War, that everybody understands what the stakes are. And that is who is going to be dominant in Persia, at the end of the war, the British are the ones that are there at the beginning of it. And then who is going to be dominant in Mesopotamia, where the Germans think that they're in quite a strong position prior to um, the war and end up really because of the German relationship with the Ottomans um, and end up the big, um, the big losers. So in a way, I would 
we wanting to say we should take all material resource questions very seriously. But I think that energy is pivotal, pivotal geopolitically. Once you get into the 20th century, because it's the energy source that dominates the minds of military planners, because that they see the advantages of they, they see the advantages of oil fuel navies. And once we're not that far into the First World War, we're into the question uh, uh, of airplanes as well. Right. Thanks. Well, I mean, th those comments sort of. I, I was going to follow up by by asking, and, and you, you've sort of signalled part of the answer there. Is it always the case that there's a central commodity in understanding global conflict? I mean, is it is it that it's only in the 20th century after what you just said, or, or is it actually something to do with the Industrial Revolution and you could see a, a different commodity playing this role earlier? It's hard to see what it would be if you were talking about medieval Europe or sort of pre-Mughal India or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I kind of lean to the view, and I think this is actually a really complicated historical question, but I mm. lean to the view um, that fossil fuel energy is transformative in this respect, and that it is not possible to understand um, how Britain became the kind of imperial power that it did in the 19th century without understanding the importance of coal to that. Now, got to be careful here because obviously the British Empire began before British were using coal for anything other than heating purposes. So you can't really say that no coal, Britain, no Britain is an imperial power. That argument like doesn't work. But if you say like, how did Britain become so dominant in the middle of the 19th century? And in particular, I would suggest, how was it the case that the led by Britain, the European imperial powers opened up China in ways that would lead to China's effective you know, fall, quite dramatic um, fall from the 1840s onwards. I think that the British use of steam, coal fueled um, battleships, beginning of the first opium war is pretty significant to that. So I would say you don't have a geopolitical struggle over controlling coal resources in the same way because coal was a lot harder to move around at that point because of its weight but if you say why was it the case that certain european powers became why did the why did the world become as europeanized as it did by the european empires in the 19th century particularly from the middle i'd say that coal is absolutely central to that and that then the problems that those same European imperial powers face come about when coal stops being the energy source that matters for military power and the oil starts to be um, it. And then it's not at all difficult to see why it is over the course of the 20th century that the ascendant powers are the United States, Russia slash Soviet Union. And yet coal is not particularly concentrated in Britain in the 19th century. It's, it's all over the place. It's... But the British have been, the thing about the British and coal is, is the British have been using coal for heating since about the 13th century. I mean, Britain's use of coal is very historically odd. Um, and I think it's not a coincidence that Britain is the first country to um, industrialized, not just because it's got a domestically abundant supply of coal, that was true, say, of like China um, too, um, but the, in part, really, the ecological conditions in um, England in um, particular uh, and um, what became a, a genuine shortage of um, wood uh, and the ease by which coal could be moved from the northeast of the country down to um, London meant that British started using coal in an economic sense earlier than anybody else did by some distance and more volume. And then they became the first country to um, transition from sail-based navy to a coal-based navy. And then that's a pretty important part, I'd say, of, of how the European powers became as 
dominant as they did in Asia over the course of the second half of the 19th century. Okay, thanks. Um, can I just take you to a different issue now? So, I mean, these questions to, until now have been largely about the importance of a particular sort of commodity to your argument. I detect something else that's important to your argument, which is geography. Um, I mean, you mentioned towards the end there that there was structural competition in Eurasia. We don't always talk about Eurasia. That's an interesting way of thinking about the world. There's this big landmass. And I think I, I think I read that you said it's the only supercontinent in the world somewhere. I just wanted you to reflect on why geography is playing that role in your argument. After all, other historians talking about other times have seen things like common sea, the Mediterranean, as being important. And we live in a time where those sort of the fact of land-based communication is arguably less important than it's been in any other historical time because of different modes of communication and so on. So why is, why is land-based communication as represented by Eurasia important in your argument? I'm not sure I would frame it in terms of land-based communication. Um, Links. Yeah, mm. but I, I, think, I think what's underlying what you're asking, Robin, is really interesting because in, in lots of ways, the framing um, of the post-Cold War world around globalisation or that narrative around globalisation if you think about it, it was a very anti-geography way of looking at the world. Mm. Basically said geography didn't matter mm. um, any longer, that there was a, a global economy, um, global um, communication, and that there was some kind of, in some ways, kind of like global directional history uh, in which ever-rising living standards were going to lead to greater political um, convergence mm -hmm. um and that certainly where supply chains were concerned the idea was that geography didn't really um, matter at all i think energy is really always though being once you start thinking about it a serious caveat to the the geography doesn't matter um argument and it's always i think like geography plus politics i don't think the geography by mm -hmm. itself is determinant but if we just take one example which is obviously um pretty pertinent to what's happened over the course um of the last um year um and that is russia and ukraine if we go back to the aftermath of the Suez crisis uh in 1956 and the turn back in europe to soviet energy something i, I could have said a bit more about really when I was talking um, earlier, you know, pipelines had to be built um, to take that um, gas, oil and first oil and then um, gas from the Soviet Union to, um, let's just keep it to West Germany in particular. And decisions had to be made about under which land or under what sea that they were going to pass. Um, and the decision was, um, that those pipelines was going to go through Ukraine when it was a republic of the, the Soviet um, Union. When the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, the fact that those pipelines went through that land in Ukraine took on a very different meaning when Ukraine was an independent mm -hmm. state um, than when um, it was part of the Soviet Union. Because essentially, if you look at it from the Soviet point of view, or sorry, the Russian point of view, I should say, um, so, and this was true before Putin came to power, that Russia's principal exports on which their entire econ economy depended um, went through a country in which, a pipeline through a country in which had very difficult relations um, with. Uh, and the Russians started looking for solutions. I mean, even before Putin came to power um, under um, Yeltsin, they said, we don't want these pipelines through the land of Ukraine, we would rather go under the sea. And they first went under the Black Sea, um, the Blue Stream pipeline as it was concerned to Turkey. And then they persuaded, as we know, the Germans to bypass Ukraine by going under the Baltic um, Sea and building like two um, pipelines. And so I think that once you start thinking about transit of energy and particularly actually um, gas 
transit, mm -hmm. which until the middle of the 2000s was actually pretty difficult to move around by um, sea, above sea, I mean by that, I not underwater pipelines, but actually by vessels. Then you just can't, you just can't keep geography out of it. And then we go, if we go back to the question that you asked me about you know, the First World War and, and food, the fact that um, it's very possible for Ottomans, now Turkeys, we still see, to control traffic in and out of the Black Sea, indeed has a legal right to do so under the Montreux Convention of 1936. This makes a great deal of difference mm -hmm. um, to what can be transported out. Uh, if you had an open ocean around Ukraine, it would be very different than Ukraine be sitting where it is in relation to the Black Sea. Great, thanks. Um, here's a different sort of question again. So the, the title we have of the thing is Global Energy Politics and the Cost of Living Crisis. And I guess I want you to reflect on the domestic consequences of the argument you've put forward. What are the political, domestic political consequences? But also, how does that domestic political consequence, which we all can see in front of us, how is that reflecting back on the argument? Yeah, this is, um, it, this is obviously... Um, Interesting. I think that what we could see is that generally governments and citizens pay attention to energy questions when energy questions generate cost of living crises. Uh, that if you go back and look at the, the discourse uh, in Western democracies uh, in the 1970s, um, you can, it's, it's, um, you know, it's energy saturated um, and um, you have people making some really quite sophisticated arguments you have a set of arguments the limits to growth arguments uh, about saying actually we need to face up to what it means to live on a finite planet in dealing with energy resource um, questions um, you have a whole political agenda uh, in the United States about deregulation, what's later gonna get called neoliberalism, which is really driven by the desire to um, deregulate the federal energy state that's emerged in the United States in response to the energy crises of the, uh, the 1970s. And then if we move to now, I think we can see um, that politicians in European countries have been incredibly nervous, for very understandable reasons, about simply saying, oh, these energy shocks are taking place, whether they're because of the war or for other reasons, and we'll just let that play out and citizens will have to take the strain of the energy shock. That hasn't been how they've responded at all. It's been a desire to say, actually, we need to put, use fiscal policy uh, in order to protect citizens mm. from these energy um, shocks. And I think that what's significant about this is that if we think, and I think I certainly do, that energy questions are fundamental to democratic politics as we go forward, not just because of the fossil fuel energy problems I've been talking about, but because of the energy um, transition, it really raises the question about whether um, politicians, governments are, able, are going to be able to keep having that kind of response to energy shocks to basically say, we will try and cushion our citizens as far as possible from the energy um, mm -hmm. problem um, because we understand that there's such a direct relationship between perceptions of the cost of living and energy um, prices. How long are politicians going to be able to do that? And I think underneath that lies the question of what if the energy transition actually requires us to use less energy? What if it actually, at least for the short to medium term, means reduced energy consumption? Do politicians in Western democracies have a way of talking about that? Are they still terrified by what happened to Jimmy Carter, uh, who was the politician in the 1970s, the American president, between 77 and the speed limit. Yeah. <laughs> that was in, yeah. Actually, the, there was also bans on weekend driving. Mm -hmm. some, but, um, uh, do they look at Carter's fate and say, actually, that's just electoral suicide? 
for uh, any Western politician to say that we all need to start using less um, energy. And I think that, that the conclusion is what we've seen in the course of this last year is that there's some willingness a bit to say we might need to make a few sacrifices to protect Ukraine's independence. But generally, the response has been, no, we need to try and protect citizens from energy hardship. But whether that's sustainable or not, I think that's a really important question um, for the future. OK, I'm going to shortly I'm going to turn over to the audience for just one last mm -hmm. follow up question on a sort of more domestic um, matter. You know, I, I said what would be the impact back on your argument and no, no. of these domestic things and. Well, I mean, there's a whole discussion, isn't there, about the world we live in, in Western democracies, and it revolves around the concept of populism. And that's noticeably absent from your analysis of the you know, sort of disjunctural forces that are at work. How, how does that figure in your argument? Is that is that consciously being set aside? Are you putting an alternative argument? I mean, this is a large yeah. question and we want to get some Christmas noise, yeah. but I, I just thought I should follow up. I mean, obviously the living crisis is, could feed into that in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, I had a certain reluctance in my book to, um, actually not just in the book, in other things that I've written to, to embrace the language of populism, um, mainly because I thought that it was being used as a um, kind of pejorative shorthand at times for outcomes in democratic politics that many liberals didn't like and that it wasn't necessarily have much explanatory um, force and if I give an example I would say I don't think you can really lump the Trump phenomenon in the United States with Brexit I think if you just sort of treat them as populist moments then you don't get a very deep understanding of either why Brexit occurred or why someone like Donald Trump could be elected president um, of, the, um, of the United States. Um, and I preferred in um, my book, Disorder, to use much older concepts of democratic excess as a problem for democracies and aristocratic excess as a problem um, for um, democracies and really to see aristocratic excess so concentrations of like wealth and power including in relation to technocratic um, power as an important part of the political disruptions of the of the the 2010s i think when it comes to the energy question if we just treat populism in, in, in the kind of shorthand way in which it was um, used is there is a way I think of of framing the response thus far to the cost of living crisis um, as being worried about the democratic reaction to it precisely because um, of the concerns about the futures of democracy that were generated um, by the events around two thousand and sixteen um, and fearing that the energy transition will become the next thing that will allow, quote, populist politicians to mobilize democratic discontent against elites. And so I, I wouldn't use that language, you know, that would be my preferred language for, mm -hmm. for analyzing that um, issue. But I think that um, in that sense, the, the Gilets jaunes protesters in France have kind of haunted the way in which politicians in Western democracies, in Europe in particular, have responded to the um, cost of living crisis and the energy part of it over the course of the last year. Okay, listen, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to the audience here. And as I say, we've got an audience online. Um, if you want to ask a question, please put your hand up, but don't ask until the microphone comes to you. Um, can I just, I think this gentleman was first here. And Ed, could you just say who you are and where you're from so that our, our podcast um, audience can... Hello. Yeah, great. My name is Diaz. I'm an undergraduate student here at LSE. I'm from Kazakhstan, oil-rich country. Um, I wanted to ask, Professor Thompson, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask, so there's an argument in political science called the natural resource curse, which suggests that 
the access to natural resource rents, in particular oil rents, in the authoritarian regimes enables those regimes to stay in power and prevent any democratic forces within those countries. Now, the logic of that argument would suggest that if there is a change to access to those oil rents, for example, due to the energy transition or simply the depletion of oil reserves, we could expect further democratization in those countries. And usually when people talk about this argument, you know, they use examples of post-Soviet area, uh, Venezuela, Middle East, all authoritarian areas. Although it seems contrary to your final remarks of your speech and the example of Germany and Pakistan, just wanted to ask whether you still think that the democratization across the world could be a byproduct of the energy transition. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. that's 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 a really good question, and it's a really hard question. Um, the reason why I think it's a is a hard question is is that we collectively, I don't think, have any idea how long the energy transition is going to take. Um, if you look at the, the more optimistic scenarios that the International Energy Agency are producing, there's still going to be considerable amount of oil being consumed by 2050. I'm picking 2050 because of net zero 2050. Let's just say for the sake of argument, it's like 50 million barrels a day, which is about half what it is at the moment. If you look at it from the oil producing countries point of view, that's still quite a lot of oil. It's certainly not enough to keep all the oil producing countries going, but it's still enough to keep some of them doing pretty well and then it's a question of like well which ones are going to be the last ones standing who are going to be providing that even if it was only 40 million barrels of oil um, a day so I think trying to make predictions about any individual country and their political prospects um, is pretty difficult unless you've got a sense of like well are they going to be players in the end oil game so um, to speak. I also think that this question of the relationship between the form of government um, and oil production is, is pretty difficult, actually. It's more tangled than people think. And I think part of the reason why there's not a lot of clarity on it is, is because the country that isn't usually analysed is the United States. Uh, you know, the United States was for you know a long time in the 20th century, obviously, is again now the world's largest oil producer, but it was the world's largest oil producer by some distance for the, the 20th century, most of the 20th century. It was largely domestically self-sufficient. I would say that actually its oil had an enormous impact on its domestic politics, just not in the ways in which, say, oil now has an impact on Saudi politics or Kazakhstan's politics or you know, Russia's um, politics. So I think you need a lot more factors in explaining the domestic politics that is generated by having oil than just, oh, these are rents, and then whoever gets control of the state gets to distribute that as patronage um, effectively. I, I, I don't think that that works as a narrative once one brings the United States into it. And at the same time, I think that as a story about democracy, that oil is just underplayed in the story that's told about the United States um, as democracy. I think American democratic politics has been profoundly shaped by oil questions, um, just not in the ways in which we usually talk about. I'll just use that opportunity to pick up a, and one of the members of the online audience who's asked a rather similar question, but it's more of a focus on the Middle East. This was Alex Martinos, who, who says that he's a former Clare College student, a former LSE student, and works in the energy sector. So somehow I think he needs to have a go. Um, and he, he's asking a very similar question about, you know, what if it takes decades for the change to take place? But what's it going to mean in particular for the Middle East? So, I mean, you, you've sort of answered it, but perhaps on the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, I think that what we what we can say, um, say with the... Um, the Middle East um, is that there's a real difference between the countries, and I'm just going to pick two to make the point, because I think the, the, the contrast can be seen most clearly, where oil production has been stable and effective really for a long period of time, Saudi Arabia, and 
country like Iraq, and to some extent Iran, um, with large oil reserves and a history of pretty erratic production and lots of political instability at different times, undermining the capacity to produce um, oil. So what you have in the Saudi Arabian case is stable production, I mean, subject to OPEC plus decision-making, but stable production and aging oil fields. And what you have in Iraq's case is lots of oil reserves, underutilized oil reserves in their own um, terms and lots of political problems um, around the, the oil um, industry. So I think um, if you then said like, well, which of them has got the better chance of being part of the end game for oil, so to speak, that, that's quite a difficult, mm. that is quite a difficult question mm. um, to, um, to answer. Um, and some of it will depend upon um, geopolitical questions that won't be determined either within Iraq itself or within Saudi Arabia um, itself. And one of the striking things about what's happening with Iraq is that essentially the Western companies are retreating and the Chinese companies um, are staying and um, expanding. Um, mm -hmm. And the question of how China then views oil over the next like 20, 30 years, where Iraq's concerned is probably quite a bit more important than the way in which say American Western oil majors um, do. That's not obviously the mindset that was brought to the problem of the Iraq war. Um, it's one of the ironies um, of it now um, in, um, in a way. Um, but I guess I'm saying that I, I think how again it plays out this plays out for any the energy transition plays out for any individual middle eastern country is is still um there's a lot of different things to consider thanks so um we've got some more questions let's see um perhaps if you could take the gentleman with the glasses hello <clears throat> Hi, um, thanks for the talk so far. Um, I'm Arthur. from doing a philosophy master's at King's. I remember a few years ago that there was a lot of news about um, new discoveries of gas fields around Turkey and in the Eastern Mediterranean. And there were kind of geopolitical tensions emerging around that. And they were involving Egypt and Israel and Cyprus and, and Greece as well. So just wondering, um, considering all, all those kind of stories have dropped off the radar over the last few years, obviously, because have been more major geopolitical events but would you say that gas in the eastern mediterranean might become more of a factor in the world energy balance and in european geopolitics particularly if say turkey or israel or greece become more powerful gas suppliers yeah i spent a lot of time in my book on this question <laughs> kind of frustrated in a way i spent um almost all the time that I spent talking about um, disorder on podcasts and interviews, answering endless questions about Ukraine, which is very understandable, obviously, in the circumstances. But um, I didn't want to talk about the East Mediterranean too, um, because I think that uh, the tensions there are really um, ominous in some ways, and they really are important um, for understanding how um, the geopolitics of Turkey's relations with European countries, Turkey's position in NATO, Turkey's relations with the European Union are, are going to develop. And I think in order to understand why this is so, we go back again to that beginning of the 20th century, uh, because um, it wasn't just the Germans who were the the great losers of that oil competition. It was Turkey um, or independent Turkey because it became um, by 1923. And if you listen to um, Erdogan speeches, I mean, they're quite hair raising um, on this subject. And he very much sees Turkey as 
having historical grievances in terms of access to energy resources that need to be addressed. And the language in which he is used to pursue Turkey's interests in the East Mediterranean um, is pretty confrontational. Uh, and in some ways, I think it is fair to say that Turkey has been rather shut out of those gas developments in the East Mediterranean. Uh, and Erdogan has been wanting uh, to use the Turkish Navy in order to try to carve out some of that water where the resources might be for, 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 um, for Turkey. Uh, it caused a great deal of tension between Erdogan and Macron in like 2020. And I think as European countries look or need have to look away from Russia for alternative gas supplies, that can only actually amplify all those tensions in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And then it makes a really big difference as to what the outcome of Russia's war in Ukraine is, given the relationship going back to geography between the Black Sea and the, the Eastern Mediterranean uh, and Turkey's position right now still as the arbiter uh, of access to the Black Sea during um, war time. Um, so an outcome of the war in which Russia was actually strengthened in the Black Sea and Russia's relationship with Turkey was strengthened at the expense of Turkey's relations with other NATO members, I think will have quite significant medium term consequences for those geopolitical tensions in the, the East Mediterranean. So I, I think if if you want to look at um, the geopolitical future of fossil fuel energy, um, the Eastern Mediterranean is a place where we've got to pay a lot of attention. Okay, I'll just take another question from the online audience. This is a question from Owen Raftery, who's an LSE student from Ireland. And um, the question uh, points out that there's a lot of focus on the big players in the geopolitical struggle for energy, but wants to know about what the role of smaller states are, especially those who manage to be self-sufficient in energy, and suggests that uh, and refers to Ireland, Denmark, the Netherlands, some of which have lots of wind power and so on. Do they have a role, asks the questioner, to play in fragmenting the concentration of power in the larger states? Yeah, I think you really have to distinguish here between, you know, like different forms um, of um, energy um, and you need to distinguish between um, electricity um, and um, oil and gas on the other side. Obviously, gas is used in electricity um, generation, but if we just take it as electricity versus oil um, for the moment without in a vast scale, you know, electrification, um, then um, electricity cannot be used to, um, in the way in which oil is presently being used in the, it, it used in um, transportation. So countries can, say a country like Denmark would be a good example here, I think. A country like Denmark can do a very, very good job um, on the energy transition where electricity is, concerned. I think undoubtedly Denmark is a success story um, in that respect. Um, but that doesn't by itself mean that it's got an oil answer and it doesn't mean that it's got a gas answer where um, heating or industry um, is um, concerned. And I think that that's the first question you have to ask about any individual energy countries um, prospects is, is look at how they're doing in terms of decarbonizing electricity, and then look at what their foreign oil <laughs> gas dependency um, is. And for European countries, including the Netherlands, which was obviously a case um, listed, which has been a large scale um, gas producer in the past, including obviously exporting to other European um, countries, um, the Netherlands is in decline um, as a gas. Um, producer. So if you're going to take European countries and say, what are their energy um, prospects in the energy uh, transition? A great deal of that is going to depend upon making rapid technological progress 
um, in being able both to store electricity and then to electrify um, those processes that currently rely um, on um, oil and gas. I think where there's good prospects um, in Europe uh, and the smaller countries are part of that story is in terms of constructing a regional electricity network, um, which I think is grown in, in Europe. The, the energy, sorry, the electricity interconnectors have been particularly important during this um, year, including, or not least one might say for France, um, given the problems that France has had, uh, had during the course of 2022 with its um, nuclear um, reactors. Um, but that in itself doesn't solve European countries' foreign oil and gas dependency problem. Great, thanks. Right, now this is what always happens. There's no questions and then there's mm -hmm. lots and lots of questions. Um, can I have this um, person in the green at the back here? Yeah, I just, I was wondering uh, how far you think- Sorry, hydro could you just say who you are and where you're from too, just for the online audience? Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, Izzy Sonnex, so I'm at National Grid ESO. Uh, I was just wondering how far you think hydrogen production is a kind of valid substitute for gas uh, for European countries. Yeah, I don't pretend to be an expert uh, on hydrogen. I mean, I think that um, there are, you know, like reasons to uh, have some optimism where hydrogen's um, concerned. Um, I think how green that hydrogen turns out to be might be uh, another um, another um, matter. I think one of the things, though, that is is really important um, is is that the more these questions about how the energy transition is going to be done and strategic choices are made by, like for instance, are we looking to do hydrogen or are we looking to do electrification? And they involve very different approaches to the um, energy transition. The more that that is part of the political debate, then in some sense, the better the politics of the energy transition um, is, um, is going. Um, I you know, lean on the side quite strongly of thinking that the energy transition is going to be quite um, slow. Um, but at the same point, at the same time, I think that we should all recognize that um, at any time there are technological breakthroughs that will transform the prospects, uh, that if they occur, will transform the prospects in any, in any um, particular um, sector the difficulty is and i think this goes to the center of the problems with the energy transition is how can we know or not even how can we know because we can't know but how to make judgments when we don't know the time scale of those technological changes um, and how then do we judge um, the completing claims of different ways forward in the energy transition whether that's hydrogen or more electrification without being able to make reasonably grounded judgments about when those technological breakthroughs will occur. And then once you throw in the fact that fossil fuel energy creates its own or has its own problems, and that would be true regardless of climate change, i.e. that there's constrained supply at affordable prices of both oil and gas, then the time perspective becomes even more important because then it becomes really important to know well maybe we can manage as we are where oil and gas concern in terms of new investment if we're looking at say somewhere between 80 and 100 million barrels of oil for 20 years but what if it's for 40 years what if it's for 50 years and then that becomes a very different kind that becomes a very different kind of question so in that sense like i think it's always really important to try to think about energy questions in the round to try to think about everything at the same time and i know that that's kind of hard um but i i think that um being able to see how the different energy questions in the energy transition itself um, and the problems of fossil fuel energy themselves interact with each other is crucial 
So I have another online question here from Carmen Soprano, who's an LSE alumni and World Bank economist. And um, Carmen asks, uh, given the, your argument about energy as a source, which is central to geopolitical confrontation, might not a future confrontation be between the US and China over semiconductors in Taiwan? She asks, what are the odds of this in your opinion and what could be the breaking point that might lead to such a confrontation? Well, I think that what we can see already is, is that um, the Biden administration, uh, in terms of the moves that it made um, last year and the fact that it's now persuaded the Japan and Netherlands to, to join in with its semiconductor um, export um, ban, that these are pretty significant um, moves. If you look at it from Beijing, I think that kind of looks like economic warfare um, already. And obviously it's complicated um, by the fact that in territorial terms anyway, the most significant point of tension between China and the United States is Taiwan, and Taiwan is a place that's central to semiconductors. So um, I think that um, really significant um, geopolitical, well, I wouldn't even say, I, I, I'm going to go backwards, I'm going to say really significant geopolitical tension over semiconductors, I think is already part of the world um, in, which we, um, in which we live. I think though that we also need to think about the ways in which China is actually constrained by the energy questions in the ways in which it can handle its confrontation with the United States. And for the purposes of time, you know, I concentrated on saying, look, there's a lot of fear in Washington that China will be the geopolitically dominant player in the energy transition, and that will have broader strategic um, consequences. But China still has a really serious strategic vulnerability around energy. Uh, during the course of 2022, it signed more long-term natural gas contracts with American companies. It, you know, it is dependent upon the US for um, liquid natural gas imports, at least um, at the moment in the world in which there is significant, um, very significant Eurasian competition for um, liquid natural gas supply. It's not simply, I think, that China could cut the United States out that um, easily. And in any scenario in which China and the United States were at war, then China is vulnerable to the US Navy blockading um, vessels, particularly going through the Malacca um, Strait, carrying oil imports to um, China. And China's been very well, the Chinese leadership have been very well aware of that vulnerability to, since at least 2003. And when they um, articulated it as the Malacca um, Dilemma, and probably um, going back earlier than that um, too. So even if you focus on something like semiconductors and say, actually, look, this is you know, not far off economic warfare already, there are still ways, I think, in which energy, um, paradoxically, in this sense, is a constraining issue for China in terms of pursuing um, anything particularly confrontational with the United States. Great, thanks. Um, yes, someone over that side, if we can. Hello, um, I'm Tom. I used to be one of Robin's um, students. Um, I now work for a law firm, which is not relevant, but I used to um, work for Reuters and did an um, energy transition conference for them. Um, so I got the opportunity to talk to lots of people who were in the industry and there seemed to be sort of two schools of thought there were the cynics who really didn't think it was possible and that the, there were issues around energy density intermittency that there weren't enough materials and then there were the people who were more hopeful about it being possible although maybe thought that the 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 political side of it just wouldn't wouldn't work and i know that you said um um that you you, you think it will be slow but i wondered what side you'd you'd fall on, on on that debate and and leading on to that the other really interesting thing you said was around um rare earth metals and and their role in electrification um and how europe will have to almost recreate the 
colonialism of the of the past because they're unwilling to dig up lithium in Portugal or rare earth metals in Sweden because it gets rid of a forest. Um, I wondered whether you'd looked into sort of deep sea mining because there's lots of hopes that rare earth metals can just be sort of dredged off the bottom of the seafloor and whether you've thought about whether this leads to a sort of new paradigm in geopolitics because energy has always been located in national territorial borders even offshore like deep water oil rigs are still within a territory and the deep sea mining is literally in the middle of like the pacific middle of the atlantic it's not within a territorial border i wondered if you just could talk to any of that yeah i haven't re i'll be honest i haven't really thought about the the deep sea mining um issue i mean what i would say is is i think we can see and we can see this actually in the in the arctic um you know like the course of um, this last year in particular, but it's been building up for at least a decade. Um, I would say that any part of the world, and whether it's land and certainly under water, where there are uh, either energy resources, hydrocarbons, or where there are metals um, that are essential to the energy transition, is going to be geopolitically fought over. Um, I don't necessarily mean in the military sense by um, that over the over the um, over the coming um, decades. On the question about you know, like optimism versus um, pessimism, I do you know lean on the pessimistic side. I think I made that clear in some of the things that I've said. I, I don't think that you can. Um, what's the way of putting this? Um, you can't wish away the energy density problem. The only form of energy that's in play for the energy transition at the moment that isn't offering less dense energy is nuclear power. Um, and nuclear power um, at the moment, as we know, is only being used to like generate electricity. And, and it's also extremely expensive. Uh, and has a whole set of waste problems, um, as we know. But if we leave nuclear power aside, you know, what we're talking about doing is basically having gone through energy transitions generally where we move from lower density energy to higher density energy, we'd be going through an energy transition where we go backwards from higher density energy to lower density um, energy. And I, I think that everybody has to understand um, that there's no a priori reason to think that we are going to get out the other end of that and have the same kind of material way of life that we have had with high density um, energy, at least in the West. I mean, we shouldn't overstate um, energy, per capita energy consumption in other parts um, of the um, world. Having said that, I think if you just are of the view, which some people are, that because we're going backwards on energy density, that we're doomed um, to failure in, uh, in some sense, I think that that kind of presumes answers to questions that are just not yet knowable about what technology can and cannot do. I, I don't think technology can overturn the laws of physics. I mean, I think that the laws of physics when they apply to energy are probably the hardest laws of physics in the universe. And I say that as a completely as a non-physicist, but as far as I can understand um, these um, um, questions. Um, but I, I think to a priori rule out that technological breakthroughs um, will ultimately be irrelevant to the density problem. I, I just don't see any basis for that judgment any more than I do for the, oh, technology will certainly solve the energy density problem and just overcome it. I think we have to, we have to recognize, we all have to um, recognize that, um, that this is a, a massive transformation um, that we've, in some sense, that the world, humanity has undertaken to and I know it's not undertaken as humanity, but in different um, states. And the outcome of this 
energy revolution, and I think that's what it is, an energy revolution, is unknown and can't be known at the moment. Right. Well, we're really quite close to the end here. So I'm just going to, if we can have a succinct answer sure, and yeah. a succinct question, we can just squeeze it in. Um, perhaps just the woman in the beige there. Hi, um, I'm Alice. I'm a former student of Helen's yeah. and um, yeah. I now work in the energy sector. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, in what ways do you think the West is getting comfortable with protectionism? And do you see this process as different in Europe versus the US? Yeah, I can answer this question, I hope, very succinctly. I think that, that the US has now moved quite firmly into being a protectionist country. I think you can see that uh, in the in energy, sorry, in the Inflation Reduction Act. I think if you look at the remarks that the Biden administration made after the World Trade Organization ruled against it, the US on the steel tariffs, it basically said that the the WTO belongs to an, another age. Uh, I think that this is all really bad news for European um, countries. If you have a energy depend for an energy dependency problem like European countries do, then you need to try to have trade surpluses as Germany did for a long time in order to manage that problem. And the best way of doing that is in a multilateral trading order rather than in one that is moving in a protectionist um, direction. So I think that this question of economic nationalism and the energy transition uh, and what it particularly means for Europe is really, really important. Thank you very much. Thank you for a succinct question, yeah. a succinct answer. Um, and thank you to everyone here today, but thanks especially um, to Helen Thompson. I mean, I think that's really a very interesting set of questions you put on the table. Any one of them might have occupied us for an yeah. easily for a couple of hours, but the way you've shown the intersections between them and the potential importance for all of our futures is very illuminating. So join me in thanking our speaker. <laughs>